Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to our next Blister panel session, where I am so pleased to have on uh, Elise Saugstad, Sage Cataburga Elosa, and Pep Fugis, who, again, is uh, actually just like, I don't know, 30 or 40 feet away, but um, we're, we're, it kind of works best for us to kind of roll this panel, uh, kind of keep it virtual. And then we may be getting joined, we'll, we'll see, by, uh, by Eric Hjorlifsson. Uh Our best guess is he's just scooted down to uh, his workshop and is dremeling something. But uh, we'll, we'll uh, hope to have Hoji join us here in a second. But uh, so first of all, thank you all. It's, it's great to have you here and, and to see all of you. And um, uh, I think we'll just get started by, I think, hearing a little bit about um, how this particular season is going for each of you. Um, it sure seems like complicated or challenging would be perhaps uh, some terms that might uh, be relevant, but but I prefer to hear from you. Um, Elise, why don't we have you start? Yeah. Um, well, you know, this year is, it's different. Um, I'm not going to complain though, because there are a lot of people in a lot of worse positions with what COVID has presented them and being a skier, um, you know, it, it changes things, but being a skier, a pro skier, our whole, you know, we adapt. And so I think we just make the most of it. Um, I've been home a lot more here in Tahoe, which the season hasn't been the most amazing season up to this point, but at least um, avalanche condition wise, it's a bit on the safer side. So I take that as a plus and yeah, uh, just making the most of it. Sage? Yeah, um, I feel like, yeah, like Elise said, kind of the situation of, I guess, yeah, kind of where we're living and how, how our lifestyles are, it's definitely like hasn't. I don't know, things have simplified, I'd guess, I'd say, um, would be kind of, because yeah, this, what was like just traveling and always kind of like this on the go lifestyle, even though that's kind of changed over the last five years for me having kids, um, it's still been happening. And like last year, kind of, I was scheduled for TGR trips and then that was, you know, all kind of like rug pulled out from under us at the, at the end and sort of surprising. And so then this year, in a way it's been like we've kind of already reset and so it's kind of just like a more chill mentality i'm kind of just going into the year like well we'll see and um in that it's been way well, i feel like elise says like pretty darn fortunate um to be able to be skiing and doing this as you know, as our, as our job and, and making things work and having a good, good winter with, with whatever we get and traveling hasn't been a big part. I did just do a trip with TGR just to Washington. So like keeping this kind of like regional theme of, of travel, feeling pretty good and kind of exploring the backyard. And so in a way it's been like almost a better kind of season in some ways because yeah, it's like less expectations and and kind of making the best of it. Um, yeah, it has been a bit strange. Um, the avalanche conditions around the Salt Lake area has been incredibly tricky. There have been quite a few incidents. Um, and so that has kind of put everybody on our toes. I guess overarching, um, I mean, sponsors are very um, accepting of the situation. So, I mean, I've, I've had a great time being at home, skiing with my kids, like my four and five-year-old skied High Rustler uh, a couple of weeks ago. And that was like a pretty magical moment. And I was glad I was home to be a part of that. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've really been enjoying like being at home and, um, and staying close, like we can't really venture too far out into the backcountry. There's just crazy high heavy danger all over the place. Um, so it's just kind of, I don't know, it's, it's been kind of a breath of fresh air almost in a weird way, because you just have to step back and accept the realities of the situation. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm, I'm also curious to ask, 
I asked you about this season, but the fact is, as Sage alluded to, I mean, this really started last year, right? And it's like, you know, spring is obviously a big time, I'd say typically for you folks. And that's the part of the season that everything just came to a, a halt. So um, I Sage, I like this idea that it's like, oh, it's kind of actually simplified this year. Is if this season feels a bit simpler, was last season just absolute like what the hell is happening right now? Or yeah, yeah. I mean, I kind of I feel like I kind of already <clears throat> touched on on what it was like. It definitely was sort of I, I sort of had put all my my filming eggs into the March and April basket, so it was sort of like, oh well, I guess you're not doing anything, but. I'm at a point in my career and where it's like, Oh, I missed a year filming. Oh, well I have my, I was working on a personal movie at the time. So it was like, I got my own project going big deal. Um, so it was definitely kind of shocking, but also just like, like Pep said, just really a, <clears throat> a time to kind of step back and see, gosh, what am I doing? What is my lifestyle like? And what really matters to me? And what do I want to carry forward with? Elise? Yeah, same boat as Sage. I mean, all my filming projects were meant for the spring and it all got shut down. Um, but so going into this year, definitely had a bit more of a we'll see what happens expectations. Um, I think being uh, in North America, we're so incredibly blessed compared to Europeans because our ski resorts and skiing in general is open here. And so uh, just being able to get outside and ski um, is such a big deal, not even just for work, but just for a personal standpoint, right? Not being stuck inside. So, um, yeah, I just will continue to say I'm, it's, it, things are, things are pretty good in, in my position. I'm pretty happy. I'm, I'm very lucky. Pep, any thoughts about the kind of last spring into coming into this one? Um, yeah, I mean, you can't predict a pandemic um and like we don't really know how to act and react to such a situation so um yeah i guess you know it's just uh you just have to roll with it um i mean the let's see in the spring right kind of when the pandemic really set in um i was we were like dead set on um, shooting a short video for our new ski that was launching the Vital 100. And it was like, it was a pretty wild scenario for me because we were like entering into this new space where we didn't really understand how bad COVID was or how it was really going to affect, I mean, affect all of us. Um, I mean, we were like, you know, putting bleach on our, um our our produce before it came in and like letting it sit in the garage and that whole scenario um and then of course things have you know changed significantly from then to now um yeah i don't know I, I think you just like we just have to roll with it we just have to be comfortable with whatever um the world is throwing at us well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the world pre-pandemic, and um, you know we've got a rather uh, distinguished uh, group of panelists here. And one of the things I thought would just be fun would be to kind of to ask each of you um, where you all have had so many interesting and remarkable moments in skiing. Um, I wondered if you might be able to single out just one particular moment in time, and it could be one trip or one line where it just felt, you know, when thinking about it right now, where it just felt like everything just kind of lined up for you. And I was thinking like, I was tempted to describe it like if there was a kind of a transcendent moment perhaps, or else just a moment that really represented a big personal accomplishment that when you think about these things in your respective careers, it still feels really meaningful today. Yeah, there's, I, I feel like the kind of like 
the I, I always like have focused on and been lucky to have been able to have kind of a lot of support so that I've been able to use patience in kind of the, the long term of like I'm always like if it's not like a hell yeah then it's I'm just chilling and when it came to like you know kind of substantial moments in my career going down they were kind of this like all signs pointing to like now is the time to do blank or this is happening and it's time to seize this moment. And it's not like being forced and you're not um, chasing the wrong, you know, the wrong dragon kind of thing like mm -hmm. you're, you know, and, and those like moments in when they're happening, they're sort of um, intoxicating a little bit. Um, it almost feels like you're like, well, what just happened kind of um, sometimes it's like, over the course of a couple days, or maybe it's just a few hours. Um, it's kind of been different. And there's maybe been three or four in my life that have, that have happened. And it really is like, um, reinforce that, um, kind of idea, just that like, yeah, when it's, when it's all signs point to yes, you know, and if it's not, then it's, you know, then do whatever feels right. <laughs> um, and, and that's kind of, I feel like those, those kind of moments have, have been like kind of based around that, which is sort of an interesting thing. Cause um, yeah, it's like, you can't really like these pinnacle moments in skiing are usually around risk too. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you can only do that so much. Mm -hmm. So it's like, how do you kind of incorporate that same aspect in life in general? Yeah. Which one? Yeah, I mean, so, I but know. I think if you I said, feel like those things are like, uh, <laughs> I think, you know, I if, know, if you're saying like, gap or something. like the transcend, <laughs> the transcendent, okay, well, like maybe, and so you're welcome to kind of reject the premise, right? Like, okay, the transcendent moments, those maybe aren't some of what some of us might think of if you're like, yeah, I was terrified you know, and got done and was just happy to be alive, right? That would be a different thing than like, it was this moment where every, the universe fell away or something, but um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so and that happens a lot too. There's a lot of the, the terrified, just relieved to be down. And you're just like, wow, that was crazy that that, that worked out. But <laughs> I don't know. I, I just feel like, um, yeah. I mean, rather than, right. There's, those little things that have gone down are just as significant as the kind of day to day. I don't know, just like the other day skiing, you're like, Oh wow, this is skiing's good. It's time mm -hmm. to go. Like things are locked in. All right. I'm going to go hit this air that I've been wanting to hit. Like I, I, that's what I'm kind of, yeah, I feel like where you kind of incorporate it and, and it's, that was a small minuscule comparison to being in a dish pit and having this moment, like I'm going to double front flip shads, get pyramid gap or whatever, you know, that was a moment. And, you know, the AK moment of like, just being like, oh, when you, when you just see what you can do, I think that's, um, you know, like when those moments come together, you're like, oh yeah, when you have that vision. Elise. Um, I go way back before I was a professional skier, um, but this, so it was the first year I'd, I just started dating Cody and um, it's like mid-March-ish. And um, back then it was like, I had just moved to Squaw that year. And I started dating Cody and started getting in with just realizing like all the terrain that Squaw has to offer. Well, by that point in the season, and that was a really good winter that year, um, people aren't necessarily showing up for the pow days. And then there were no pros. They were all out filming that day. I remember Cody, you know, he was out filming with Ingrid that day with MSP. And it was just prime conditions to go. And I was with my buddy and I just started ticking off a bunch of lines and, and put special airs at Squaw. And it just felt so amazing because, um, and this is even before being pro to like have the Kodak courage, you know, there was none of that going on. It was just getting out there and pushing myself in a way that I'd never necessarily done on skis. And it, it was just a different way. And it was 
it was so exhilarating because it was, um, you know, it was very like me just going and pushing myself. And um, I remember calling up Cody and being like, oh, my God, you have no idea what I hit today. It was so cool. And like I started telling him everything. And he's like, that's awesome. Our, our day of filming was not that great. Mm. <laughs> so um, because the conditions had just turned in the backcountry. Because in March in Tahoe, it, it, things warm up pretty fast. Anyways, um, that, was, that was a pretty, pretty awesome day. I remember feeling pretty proud of myself. Mm. That's great. Pep, what comes to mind? Um, I I really jived with uh, Sage's answer because there are a lot of the like elements that kind of tie the whole room together. Like those <laughs> those like transcendental moments, like they happen periodically, and a lot of times, like you're not filming or you're it's not part of like the professional ski um, vision or like um, anyway. I don't know. I think I think those moments kind of happen more often than not, like when you feel just right. Um, but there is one particular trip that comes to mind. Uh, it was in the Tordrillos. I'd always wanted to do a camping trip where you're just kind of like out on your own, human powered, under your own volition. You need to have the tools and the skills to navigate the terrain and to understand what's going to be good at what time. We'd done the research. We flew in, we had 10 days of absolutely spectacular high pressure, which we were pretty nervous about um, because they hadn't had snow in a few, probably like three or four days. Um, But the whole trip, we just like knocked off like line after line and we built jumps and aired over crevasse. And um, we like, there was this one prize line that we had our eyes on and we knew that it was going to be a huge mission to go do it. Um, and we went out there and, um, everything just kind of lined up perfectly. We got there at the right time, right when the sun was like, the sun only hit this line at a particular time, right in the evening. And it was probably like the only slope and aspect that still had really good snow. And we hit it at the right time and skied it and got down to the bottom. And we're just like, I just, I can't believe we're like out here in the middle of nowhere. And we just mm-hmm. totally scored. <laughs> um, and I remember like skinning back, it was probably like a two and a half hour skin back, um, just like with headlamps on and under the sky, skylight and stars. And just like being like, this is exactly where I want and need to be. You know, it was just like, I just felt like felt great and uh got back and drank some whiskey and um yeah it was a great trip this is fun whiskey did that happen to be at the alaska bush company <laughs> uh no we were out in uh the tordrillos on like on a glacier so oh yeah yeah i meant i was thinking that like when you got back as if like you flew in and then just flew uh, into anchorage yeah. Uh, okay <laughs> yeah 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 i wish i remembered where, where exactly we went to we went to some like kind of podunk uh, Mexican restaurant and had margaritas and we were just like unshowered. These everyone was just like, you know, looking at us like, what? Are these, <laughs> like, where do these guys come from? <laughs> huh. uh, this is fun. I could. I feel like I could just keep rolling back and asking you to kind of answer the same question again. Like these moments are pretty fun to hear about. And uh, but uh, I think what I will do instead is. Um, ask a little bit about just the ski industry today and the sort of evolution of it. And um, I guess I would ask, what are you happiest about? What do you like most about how the ski industry has been evolving as you've been a part of it or just as you've sort of seen it, you know, over the course of your life? Um, Elise, what comes to mind? I mean, this is kind of a low-hanging fruit one for me, um, but it's women in skiing and the way we things have evolved and completely changed from when I was first a pro. Um, you know, it was it, the the ski industry as a whole, from the movie companies to the actual ski companies, really took on that uh, token female, um, and it, it was it was just hard to do much as a female. Um, unless you were that one chosen female. And now um, the industry has embraced women and realized 
how important they are to the industry. It's not just even from a marketing perspective. It's like, it's be, well, we're valuable, you know, because women ski, women like to ski and women like to see other women ski. So um, it's, it's different now. You know, there's multiple women in movies. Um, I get a chance to go on trips with women. Um, just watching what women are doing in skiing is some of the most exciting and progressive skiing that's happening right now. You know, on the Fried World Tours, uh, what the women have been doing has been, it, it's just, it's mind blowing, you know, and, and um, even like last year at Kings and Queens, the Corbett's um, competition, when Veronica Bell threw that huge backflip and stomped it you know that was what was mind-blowing of course the guys were doing some crazy tricks but we've seen that before right you know so um i'm just really really excited about where women are at in the industry and because more women are given visibility it allows more women to realize they have a space to go and progress and and reach their potential as well so yeah yeah Sweet. Thanks, Elise. <laughs> Pep and I, we're, we're fathers of two daughters yeah. each. So Girls we, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're grateful for the uh, groundwork that you and others have, yeah. have laid here. So thanks. Um, yeah, I feel like, um, I mean, clearly that is impactful in my life. So that's, that's a huge aspect that I've seen that is cool. And um, I think, you know, the kind of technologies um, making skiing, uh, more accessible and more fun for more people, especially, you know, it's, I, it's great when it's more fun for myself, but I feel like, um, just seeing the ski industry try to just, yeah, really make products that are, I don't know, it feels like it used to be like, I don't know if you were on rental equipment, if you were just a beginner, you were kind of just like, just kind of dealing with the worst of it all. And, now it's like even the low end skis are just like easy to ski on and that makes you know that kind of stepping stone better and people are able, able to have more fun quicker and and um you know and then for me on my side it's like seeing the technology i guess especially in kind of the touring and just like equipment becoming it, i don't think that just lighter is better i definitely feel like there's a point in diminishing returns especially in skis lightness like uh just the lighter they get they kind of get darty they don't have this like I like this kind of planing like aspect that a ski does so there's a balance there but just having light lighter boots lighter bindings better touring equipment so that we can just be doing I mean now it's just at the point it's no compromise skiing I ski the way I want whether I'm at the resort or in the back country on the same gear and it's all feels so freeing and, and, and like performance oriented. So I think that's the thing that I'm the most excited about. Remember when we used to use day wreckers? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I know we're dating ourselves, but man, those things were awful. <laughs> <laughs> so here's before Pep, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in before I let you, you know, give your own answer to this, but Here's something that we've, um, you can either, uh, well, let's just get your perspectives on this. You know, Sage was just talking about, you know, that a lot of the advancements in terms of the equipment has really opened up the accessibility of the sport. But, um, you know, none of you are like 80 year old people here. You weren't, you weren't, you didn't start skiing in leather boots, right? With non-releasable bindings, that type of thing. And I think there's always a bit of an interesting question, perhaps especially for some people who review a lot of equipment, you know, kind of for a living. What would you say to the um, perspective that, well, yeah, these advancements have been really good in terms of making things more accessible, but highly, highly skilled skiers, well, they can just go make anything work. Do we agree with this? In other words, right? Like, have you in your own personal skiing and like in the methods in which we get up or walk up a mountain have certainly improved. And I think probably a lot of us like that. But when it times, when it comes time to go downhill, someone might just think, well, Sage and Pep and Elise could literally just go ski anything 
and be totally fine and make it look good. What, what do we have to say to this perspective? No way. Uh, put, put, <laughs> put us on like a ni- 90s GS ski and I'll barely be able to make it down the mountain. <laughs> right. Seriously. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, from my perspective, like if you put me on some twigs and go ski down, like I probably won't make it look that pretty. I might still have some fun doing it, but I'll probably look like a lot of the other people out there like struggling to get down the hill on some little little tw- like light twigs um you mean rondo yeah, I mean, skis is that what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> pretty much yeah <laughs> so so you all are saying and you know sage you mentioned like the lightweight thing and that's obviously a you know its own kind of topic but you would say um that if you're on a ski that whatever you're about to drop into a line and you're just like, this is a really lightweight ski or lighter than I would like it to be for this application. You know, this is the question from like the mere mortal point of view, asking some not quite mere mortals here. You're not like, well, I still got this. Like I can rely on technique and natural ability and the rest to just be sort of okay and make this good. This is, I, this is like, what's the like Us Weekly magazine? And it's like, skiers, they're just like us, right? Because I can't stand that stuff and find it terrifying if I'm like in the wrong terrain on the wrong type of ski. Um, but for you all, I mean, so far, the guys at least are like, no, we kind of like the right equipment too. But I don't know, Elise, what are your thoughts oh, on this? 100%. I'm, I'm such a stickler that um, I've had, like the down is so important to me that... Um, I will have, I've had cast put pins into my traditional free ride boots, you know, and not even for those days that like, if the touring is really minimal, because, um, even as far as I think touring specific boots have come along and I really do like my, uh, zero G's they're still not the same hmm. as my freeride boots and, and, and the way I like to ski and, and it really detracts from my skiing. So in that instance, I have mod, I've gotten, I've had my boots modified to put pins in for those, the smaller tours. I mean, you can't get away with that in the big days, but, um, and, and when I tour as well, like a lot of times I'm still going out on my, my powder skis. I'm not picking up a pair of touring specific skis cause they're lighter because they don't ski the same. They don't ski hmm. as well. And yeah, I can get down the hill and and probably make it look just fine in normal ski circumstances. I don't feel like hmm. it's as fun for me. It's just not as fun. Hmm. And like I said, it's it's about the skiing. You know, if I'm going out for a specific tour, then I will do all the touring gear, hmm. and um, and because that's what it's about. Um, but otherwise, yeah, ski focused. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I, I like my gear that way. All right. Um, Pep, I am actually going to get back and ask you the question. I, maybe you've already touched on it, but, the uh, what evolution in the ski industry ha- have you kind of, are, are you liking most or best these days? Um, I, I, I know I interrupted you and took us down a different path, but, uh, I mean, I'm really excited about the evolution that's actually happening right now in terms of responsibility. I mean, we're kind of on this like precipice of change. Um, we're kind of like standing on the edge of like this cornice looking at navigating our line um, into a more conscientious place that kind of considers and respects nature's abundance, like the place that we play, like the places that we love so much. Um, and for so long, like the hard goods industry has really kind of turned a blind eye to the practices and like those methodologies um that we use to create our gear um and so yeah like to develop those tools with a bit of a a responsibility and conscientious agenda to reduce waste and to um, implement other sustainable um or more responsible um uh materials i think is is a lot of progress and i i I don't know, from hearing a lot of these panels, like everybody's talking, like that's a big hot topic of conversation. And uh, I really respect that, that 
the industry is really taking it seriously. Um, yeah, and like we are capable, like humans are capable of developing these materials that we can use to the same degree um, that the current materials like standards are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Sage and Elise, we had a panel session yesterday on ski design and uh, I asked the four designers what trend in ski design that they like best. And we basically got to a unanimous, um, this emphasis on s sustainability. And uh, I, I, I wasn't exactly expecting that. I didn't know what to expect, but I thought that was interesting. And just to kind of underscore what Pep was, what Pep was saying here. Um, let's go to the flip side of the coin. Um, what evolution in the ski industry are you less psyched about? It seemed clear. It, was, it seemed like an easy one just to jump right on social media. Instagram. Yeah. Oh, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah. It's horrible. Now it's in all our contracts. We have like a quantitative yeah. thing now. Like it used to just be, I don't know, go out, get your thing done, be in a movie or something, try to get published in magazines. Now it's mm. like, you got to do this many Instagrams. Like, mm. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I feel like uh, that it, yeah, it kind of is that, that way, but um, <laughs> that it has its benefits. It's really, it's been really cool. Uh, and, and it's definitely changed things. You know, I, I feel like we, you know, it, especially with the way there was a bit of magic to like creating a ski movie behind the scenes for a year and then unleashing it to the public every fall. And that kind of is not the same, but now there's a new thing and a new magic and an aspect to, yeah. to that kind of to thing. So I, I don't know. I say that's probably my like, yeah, probably one of my least favorite things, but it's also like I'm in deep and I utilize it and I like aspects of it too. Mm -hmm. I love that I can just follow all these locals around here and I just get snow reports every day on what's going on out there. And I try not to do it myself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Pep? Um, let's see. I, have, I guess, I mean, I could kind of echo some of the sentiments from both you and um, some of the conversation that was had earlier about like light skis. Um, I personally can't ski on light skis or they're not that fun for me. <laughs> um, and also kind of like the stravifying of backcountry skiing. Mm. Um, that's kind of a weird evolution that is just like go and, you know, ski as much vert as you can kind of thing. Um, and I don't know. I, I, I guess it's not like it's a terrible thing. Like I, I love that people are really getting after it. Um, and yeah, exercising and getting out in nature and like that whole, whole bit, but it seems like it also kind of turns into like a competition, um, in the backcountry space. And I don't know, it's I, maybe it's just that it's foreign to me. I don't, I'm not sure why it's, something that I don't jive well with. Mm. I'm kind I'm kind of with you, Pep. Well, I, I feel like it's like we're we're experience based, um, like seekers, not results based. And that's kind of like result based skiing, not really experience skiing. Ah, well mm. said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he took the polish to that one. That was good. He sure did. <laughs> Shine my yeah. little turd right up. <laughs> there wasn't a turd though. <laughs> it's it, 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 <laughs> it a real valid point. You know, one one thing um, that I feel like the ski industry we're kind of reaching a pinnacle moment. We're getting ourselves into a real pickle with something that has to do with skier experiences due to uh, cheap lift passes. You know, to to the the Epic Pass, Icon Pass, but just cheap passes in general. Now, I've always been a huge proponent of trying to make skiing and snowboarding more accessible, not more expensive. You know, back back in the day when squaw, when I was going to college um, down at University of Nevada, Reno, and Squaw's Pass was eighteen hundred dollars. Well, there's no way as a student I could afford that, and they didn't offer any student passes. And nowadays you'd be able to afford being a student and getting to ski at squat. And that is awesome. 
But the problem that we're getting ourselves into is mountain towns, the, the infrastructure, like the road infrastructure, um, the experience that you get when you get to a resort, they're so crowded now. And now, you know, having to shut down, um, how many people, like you could, you could come up to Tahoe for the weekend from the Bay area and not even go skiing because, well, we're at capacity in parking, we're at capacity at this. And so the experience going back to that whole experience based thing that we're, we're trying to do for skiing is being affected. Um, I feel pretty lucky that because I have so many options in my toolkit as a skier to be able to get into the backcountry and go elsewhere and travel and not be a part of it all the time. Um, but for an average person that wants to come up with their family for the weekend to go skiing, it's not quite the same. And um, there's just things that I don't think are being addressed rapidly enough yet at this point um, that comes down to the resorts in accordance also with with um, the local I don't know just the the people the boards that are making the, the decisions of how to do you know needing to do better public transportation needing to do whatever it is there's all these little things that go into skiing's gotten so popular passes are making things really cheap so everyone's coming and it's taking away for an average experience I think for people so it's just it's kind of a bummer where we're at, and I just see it um, coming to a head here real soon, probably. <laughs> that a little heavier? <laughs> yeah. I, hey. <laughs> well, well, I mean, I'll, I'll chime in for a second. I mean, it's just this year alone in like Little and Big Cottonwood Canyon have been absolutely nuts, and I can't like attribute that to cheap passes. Um, but just like people have to drive up individually and can't carpool and that sort of thing. But like when you can't even drive up the Canyon, they like shut everybody down at eight o'clock in the morning because it's already to capacity. Like, whoa, that's crazy. And yeah, like kind of, it certainly, I don't know. I guess it's good for the experience on Hill if you make it up there in time, but <laughs> You know, if you like planned your day around going skiing with your family and you have other kids in the car and everything like that, you bought the tickets ahead of time or whatever, um, that's certainly going to detract from, you know, those people's experience. There's like this push to like, oh, let's make the passes affordable for, for people. But it's like not really like the locals who they've made it affordable for. They made it affordable. Like, I don't know what a pass is. If you just buy a season pass, the resorts are still not that cheap. But you can buy the icon pass. You can buy these group passes, which if you don't live near a resort is really it's really a cool thing. In some ways, it's a cool way for these for people who live in a more urban environment to be able to access it. So it seems rad, but then there wasn't like also cheap passes for the locals. And then even if there was, it's busier now so yeah it's a complicated yeah thing. it's complicated and I'm not saying that cheap passes are a bad thing like I definitely want to reiterate that it's just a matter of um it there needs there's more layers to it and I just think um I mean I, I skied squat a day and it wasn't too crazy but the lift lines were really long and it's like that at all resorts so I no complaining here um, but it's, it's noticeable, you know, you're out there for how many hours and you're only getting a couple of laps on the hill. Um, and you know, for people that they only have the weekends, et cetera, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's just something to think about that the industry is kind of a bit in a pickle. I think, I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. I want to ask you guys, maybe not so much for advice, but about advice. And I'm, Kind of curious, um, I'm guessing you get hit up by a decent number of people. And what I don't know is whether it's like really, really young kids, like I want to be a pro skier someday, or if it's maybe more frequently from new professional skiers that are reaching out or a mix. But I guess I'm a bit curious to hear um, maybe if it is like, oh yeah, it is predominantly this sort of type of person, but maybe the question I am more, even more interested in is like, what are you being asked about 
what if, what do people want to know if they're hitting you up or you know asking for advice? Um, is there kind of a is there sort of a particular category or one or two things that you're most often asked about? Gear. Gear. Where do you where do I mount my bindings? Number <laughs> one most asked question. Probably no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, was, <laughs> I mean Sage I know I I certainly know that you sort of post about that but like I was not expecting you to say Mount Point number one far and away that's a, <laughs> by far <laughs> most advice I give Mount Point yeah to people in the industry photographers mm. kids someone who just bought Ben Chetler's 100s for the first time like <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, maybe I'm. I need to start doing this. Hit you up about where to. Hit you up more about where I should be mounting things. This is perfect. I'm glad, okay, I'm pretty prompt. <laughs> okay. Do you have like point. prescribed? Do you have prescribed uh, like copy that you just cut and paste? I should have it as one of those auto replies. Yeah. It's like, hey, I can't talk right now. But this is where you should mount your skis. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Perfect. mount point. Uh, Pep. Um, sorry, what's the question? Like, what do what do I get asked the most? Yeah, like, what, what do you get? Advice what do people, do I give to people? What do people? What are they asking you about the most? Or, yeah, like to try to like home in on like not just like yeah, I get asked to give advice, but like, what do they want to know? And then my next question is, how often do you hit up Sage asking Sage where you should mount your skis? <laughs> Uh, I'm definitely going to use that resource. I didn't know that was available to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's see. I guess more recently, it's been, um, you know, uh, what kind of kid boots, uh, what kind of boots do your kids have? Uh, a lot of stuff about my kids skiing, actually. Yeah. yeah gear questions. Your questions. Yeah. Or, or like, when did you get your kids on skis? And, you know, how did you go about that process? I think actually that's the most. Hmm. Okay. Elise. I think um, it's more traditional. Uh, do you have any advice for becoming pro? Do you have, it, it's more along those lines where sometimes it can be very, to me, it's very vague if you don't really know someone You're like, well, I don't, I don't really know where the starting point is, but if you do, then you can tailor it accordingly. And usually if it's a younger person, I mean, it's, it's, I, I always reemphasize it um, at the get go is, well, don't surpass um, education. Make sure you get your education, make sure you go to school. Cause I mean, I, I, I feel like it was Parker White that might've said this, like you're too, you're too um, blown knees away from being a janitor. You know, as a pro skier, yeah. it sounds like a Parker White quote. That huh? definitely sounds like something you'd <laughs> and, say. Uh, I, I mean, it's just, it's so important to have that in your back pocket. And, and there's a lot of pro skiers that are, um, don't have a college background, et cetera, and have done very well and are very smart people and figure it out. But if something happens to you, I mean, it's just, it's something, it's a backup plan, right? So I don't know. Backup plans are good. Well, you've got you've got somebody on the panel sitting um, sitting here that's yep. going to school currently. I know. Yeah, I going know. to college. That's quite amazing. I mean, he's he's taking over a family business, going to school, has a, is still a professional skier, and has a wife and two little girls that he spends a lot gives a lot of attention to. It's it's pretty commendable. Well, thanks, Elise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like back, back to actual advice, like versus I do get a lot of gear questions, <laughs> but, um, I, people do occasionally hit me up for, for other advice <laughs> and yeah, it, I think at least nailed it pretty much. It's, I'd say it's very similar, uh, kind of maybe vague, Hey, I'm 17 and I love skiing, you know, what do I do to, yeah, maybe less likely. I feel like established pros who are kind of up and coming they have like someone in their close-knit circle like i feel like i i've never like really reached out to like you know unless i was maybe like on a trip with somebody and we're like jiving every day and you're maybe starting to like build a rapport um but 
uh, it, people, my, my, you know, people reach out and, and kind of the, like, how do I become pro or I want to ski for whatever it is. And, and my kind of like answer that I've really kind of discovered in myself and, and seen in others is like really to like, uh, figure out what is it that you want? Is it to ski every day to, to be in the mountains every day to whatever, if, if, if it's a path of skiing and then, and then find a way because there isn't just one path and being a pro skier was a way for me to ski every day but that was what it was for me i just wanted to figure out how i could ski as much as i could and this was a path that worked but i saw my friends that were adam clark who was the same age as me basically and his path was photography and so it's that's kind of like don't get just like there's only one way, like figure out what's the best fit for you has kind of been my advice that I pass along. Mm -hmm. This is a pretty related question, I think. And so if you're like, you, you're welcome to say, yeah, it's kind of what I sort of maybe just said in the last set of answers. But um, I'd be curious to ask just, maybe to, for each of you to name one of the most valuable one or two lessons you've learned so far in your career. Um, at least, I mean, the, I like the, your two blown knees away. Um, it seems very relevant, but um, you're welcome to use that as one of your two, or if you have a couple other things you might want to share that come to mind. Well, I, like any job, I, I think, well, I think skiing, if to be successful at it, that you have to be, you have, a lot of times you do, it helps to be talented, right? And there's a lot of skiers out there, but, but there's so much more to that. I know, um, as much as we like to emanate this idea of like, oh, we're just, we're just so good at what we do. We're just, ah, it's so fun. And we're out there doing it all the time. Like there's a lot of hard work that goes into it, especially if you want to sustain a career. Um, if you're incredibly talented, the second that talent drops off, you're a flash in the pan, essentially. Um, so if you want to, and it's like I was saying, this is for any job, you know, you've got to be creative. You've got to figure out what works for yourself um, and how to navigate a path that is authentic to you, that it will be long lasting. Um, you know, and I think, um, yeah, I just, it's important to, to hustle. <laughs> Yeah, I gotta hustle if you want to make it last. Sage. Yeah, yeah, that's that's rad, Elise. You you're definitely <laughs> nailing it. Um, <laughs> I'm not the best skier on the mountain. I just uh, do all the jobs well. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I feel like you know, kind of to reiterate, it's like yeah, f focus on what you want, find a way, and uh, when you. The, the other the other thing would be um when it's like yeah when when big moves are about to go down whether that's life choices or some stunt you're gonna pull like when all signs are pointing to yes and it's a hell yeah then that's when you like put in that extra and if it's not then be patient with it so the, the waiting for it and be patient is a big thing yeah totally um i guess just to add I think one of the big thing is just like be you and kind of understand your strength. Like all of our bodies and our minds, they're all kind of structured a bit differently and we perform different. Um, but like if you work hard, you understand what those particular like nuances per se um, of like how you might, you know, succeed in one area or like you have strengths in one area over another like try to utilize those strengths how you best can um i guess like you know do what you are good at and like don't claim that you know things that you don't or you're like good at things that you're not um if like if you don't know something then like take the time to learn and understand understand like those nuances like if you can envision the things that you know that you can do, like you can probably do those things. Um, and this isn't like a call to go out and like huck your meat and, you know, it's like, oh, I think I can do that. So I'm going to do it. 
Um, but like, yeah, you got, at some point you have to also like trust your gut and your instincts. Um, and those basic feelings can give you like a lot of really valuable feedback and information like faster than you can like consciously think of those things. It seems like maybe there's a bit of a trick or a bit of an art to like when to kind of stay focused and kind of locked in and when to start looking out and venturing out and getting into other things. And I don't, Pep just used the word organic, and I don't know if those, I don't know what the secret is. Like if it's like, if there's a bit of a blueprint to this where you're like, okay, I'm pretty good and pretty comfortable in this particular wheelhouse right now. Um, but I want to actively start thinking about what else I might get into versus you just kind of let life happen. And I guess you're paying attention and um, trying to evaluate potential opportunities or areas that you might step into. Any thoughts on that? I, I don't know that I have the sort of algorithm blueprint versus I guess some stuff happens and you pay attention. Um, seek some outside, outside advice, like get some third party who like can kind of see, they can see things that you're kind of blind to. Like, um, I don't know. There, there are people that are going to be your advocates and understand your strengths sometimes even more than you even realize them. Um, and, and however that may come to be, if it's a friend, relative, family member, um, counseling, I don't know. (laughs) So, so maybe we could put that in the way of like each of you individually, you know, having a kind of wheelhouse and looking to expand that wheelhouse versus I think what one way we could maybe summarize what Pep just said is, um, someone coming up and being like, hey, have you ever thought about getting into dot, da, 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 da? And I guess I'd be interested, um, you know, Sage and Elise, how your own, how this has played out in your own life. It's, if it felt like it's been more you individually moving into new areas or a bit more of the like people coming up to you and saying, have you ever thought about looking at this area or moving into that? I feel like that there definitely is an aspect of like in life where you're always like the shoulder tap from somebody, whether it's just like, oh, have you ever checked out this zone to, yeah, a whole new perspective on kind of your life. Hmm. Um, I think that's really important to, yeah, like Pep saying, kind of whether it's uh, outside influence or that you're kind of seeking advice to or just, yeah, the kind of that collaborative aspect of like kind of inspiration and creativity, I think. And, and I think, again, it kind of goes back for me personally, it's just back to what, like people tell me stuff all the time, Hey, you should go here or check this place out or this, but it's like, what, like, what triggers some sort of emotional response in me? And, and then that's kind of when it's like, Oh, why did I just get queued up on that? And now I want to follow that further. So that's kind of how I, I look at it. Hmm. Yeah, I I think to try new things and go down new roads, there has to be some internal motivation um, that gets you to want to do that. Um, because yeah, there's plenty of people that I'll get, oh, you should try this or that or get into this or that, or you'd be so good with this. But um, it's like, well, uh, it's not really something I'm really passionate about. So even though that sounds good, it's not really my thing, but I like what you're thinking and it's great to give me some thoughts. And sometimes it does click. I don't know with outside. It just, um, well, that's just like your own personal internal filter. Like you are going to have all this stuff that's coming in and then all of a sudden you'd be like, oh yeah, that jives with me Yeah. or that doesn't jive with me or whatever. Yeah. And sometimes it just comes from within too. It's not necessarily an outside voice. You know, sometimes it's realizing like, I think I want to make this happen. And, and luckily, um, like all, all of us on this panel, we all have significant others that um, we hold in high regard. And I'm sure like at least with, you know, I know with Cody, I, what's so amazing with my partnership with him is that we get to be each other's sounding boards. And we really both know each other so well that we know how to like, steer someone um and vice versa you know and and, and bounce ideas off so that's that's really nice to have i'm gonna let you guys get going soon um if there are 
I, I'm sorry to uh, the folks listening in on this conversation. I feel like I've been dominating it with my questions. But uh, so if, if there's any questions that you want to sneak in here before I let these good folks go, um, let us know in that in the chat section. But um, I'll go ahead and ask. Um, I'm interested in the question of, for each of you, what has kind of surprised you the most in your ski careers or what has surprised you the most about your the evolution your your evolution as skiers from when you first kind of got into the game so we'll kind of give you those two two possible ways to answer yeah uh sure i'm going to probably say um a lot cuz that's what i like to do when i'm getting asked questions <laughs> uh let's see Honestly, I feel like it is finding myself working for a biotechnology company. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess it was kind of like not even close to on like something that was on my immediate radar, like that outside sphere or even like beyond. Um, I remember like getting on the plane, like I'm going to go interview at a biotechnology company. Like, what am I getting into and how did I find myself in this position? Um, I'm a skier, but, um, and then to realize that these people who are founding this company, like see a lot of value in me as a skier and me as a person and my, you know, the value and the experiences that I've had. And it's just like this full culmination kind of of my life coming together um, that, you know, I don't know, just it, it was just like a weird, weird moment where these guys were like, yeah, like we 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 see that, you know, you've been valued by the companies that you worked with, but not to the degree that we think that your worth and your knowledge and expertise is really um, something that that we could use. Um, and yeah, it was yeah, that's that was my surprise moment for sure. You don't think young Pep saw that coming? Yeah, not in the slightest bit. <laughs> Elise. Um. I mean, uh, the fact that I'm still a pro skier, I think is actually pretty surprising. I mean, I, I had, I did not set out to be a professional free ride skier when I was younger. I had planned to become a lawyer. So in my twenties, when I started before I was just taking some time before I was going to go back to school, I started doing this whole ski thing and here I am, you know, God, so many years later. <laughs> um, and I'm impressed that one, it worked out and two, I'm still doing it. And I love it. I still absolutely love it. Um, so maybe that's surprising as well, because sometimes when you turn, <laughs> a yeah, well, you know how it is, you know, when you turn oh, yeah. a passion into a job and, and I know, I know Pep and Sage could say this too. There, there's been, there are moments that we've all had where it's just like, oh my gosh, this feels like a grind. Like, any job, you know, like, I don't know, do I still have it? But, but at the end of the day, um, there are things that I still find really interesting as keeping me involved as being a professional skier. So, yeah. Elise, I would say the thing I'm most surprised about your career is that you have yet to launch your own fantasy football podcast. I feel like this is just a matter of time and that it hasn't happened yet. It surprises yeah. me. So, well, actually it wouldn't be, I think, I think if I had a podcast that had to do with sports, it had to do with all sports. You it wanted all be, sports. It wouldn't be just, I'm super passionate about, um, a lot of sports. I mean, like you name it. I mean, I still love ski racing, the Australian opens finishing up right now. Um, formula for formula one, you know, Co Co Cody's big joke is um, his ideal child would be he'd have a female and she would be the first Formula One race car driver, female Formula race car driver. <laughs> so we love all kinds of sports. You know, can't forget baseball, too. Um, I mean, football is 
but yeah. love sports in general. So. <laughs> Wait a second. Sage got... <laughs> Sage got all excited when you mentioned the Australian Open. Sage, yeah. are you are are you a big tennis fan? Did I not know about this? Okay. No, no, I just I just it was just the culmination of Elise's sports fan <laughs> yeah. love. Like yeah. it was like this, and I was just like, yeah, this is great. I yeah. I, I saw it. Okay. Yeah. I wanna I wanna listen. I would listen. Yeah, me too. I'd learn. <laughs> me too. All right. Um let's see where are we i know i've this is maybe this could be the you know the 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 tap on the shoulder that we were just talking about right when someone does like you know so like elise's well i think you probably need the the fantasy football podcast but then we could give you like another one that's just all sports all the time i think the world needs both so i don't know we'll we'll talk um uh let's see where are we here i think we got sage most surprising thing Oh, right. Um, yeah, I guess I, I'm most surprised that we don't have flat light and eliminating uh, like laser beams. Oh, my God. Levels. This yeah. is the <laughs> best thing anyone is. <laughs> yes. You know. Can we uh, we just had a least... panel about next generation materials. The first oh, person been on <laughs> the first person to invent this. Um. <laughs> I've been talking about it for years. Like imagine being able to rip full speed, like in sun in the flat light, like on a cloudy day, mm. it would be amazing. Mm. Like you just have like, in my head, I kind of wanted a little bit like, uh, like <laughs> low tech, like we're like not low tech, but uh, like from the old school Tiger Woods golf, when you used to go to the putting green, it would give you like a grid <laughs> to show you the like shape of the putting green. And like, eventually it just got to be sick graphic but back then when it was like the grid pattern like in my head that's what i want like i don't you know just like a grid that goes out you know just just far enough so i love this answer so much and we need to we need to get everybody working on this uh just this afternoon i shoved my ski tips so hard into the bottom like under a mogul that i did not see at all and uh yeah, um, so I, I, I'm buying. I'll be the first buyer of your your new goggles, Sage. Well, I think just like, you know, fat skis, we start with the heli ski ops, you know, because then they they can operate. They can already operate in the flat light, but it's just a little dangerous for clients. Yeah. And, you know, they could just be sending them. <laughs> this is good. Um, by the way, um, <clears throat> in maybe I was asking you the most surprising thing about your career um, I'm going to go with, this might be a, a bit of an update, maybe the least surprising update. I just got a message from Hoji and he said, hey, just getting back to the truck had a sled mechanical, unfortunately, and cost me a couple hours. <laughs> least, least surprising thing I've heard all day. Um, but uh, anyway, um, glad he's back. Yeah, um, we did get a, a great question coming in from Trevor. Uh, how much work do you all do? How much work do you all put into making your ski boots fit well? Um, I feel like I put in a bit more than an average person. I have a, an amazing boot guy, Corey Champagne at Tahoe, um, Tahoe Sports Hub, who does amazing work in my boots. And that's from punching them out with the, and getting the right, um, liners and, and that kind of jazz, but taking it to the next level, the Cody level, um, Cody's not quite at the Hoji level, but Cody is on his, like the garage constantly working on his boots. Um, so there's, I'm definitely not that far into that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pep. Um, I feel like my feet must be fairly regular or maybe it's just certain types of boots because some boots I get in and I'm like uh nope nope and then I put myself into a boot and I'm like oh this is perfect um and those are the usually the boots that I I ski on so um you know I do the simple molding and a you know simple footbed and I'm good to go yeah I'm kind of in the a fairly low maintenance actually when it comes to boots um Sage how about you 
Yeah, um, I, I definitely like have some preferences, just like the type of boot that I like. And it's definitely like stiff flex back to like our comp, you know, just can we ski anything? Mm -hmm. I've had years where it was like I was in a boot that I wasn't psyched on too upright, too soft, whatever. And I just like lost seven. I was like 30% of my confidence was gone. You mm -hmm. know, I was just like, I could, it was wild. So having, yeah, a, a boot that I can, so I just usually adjust my forward lean. If I can do that, ideally I have a boot that I can, um, with my touring boot from atomic, I can do that. So I have like a bunch of forward lean, maybe an extra spoiler, and then just getting a, a custom footbed and liner that, that, feels good and um i've been on the surefoot thing for the last couple of years um which is a little challenging because there's not one anywhere even close to me so i have been running the same liner for a while mm -hmm. but uh yeah there's like that foam injected like extra stiffness and just kind of form fitting and i'm kind of like pep i don't have like i don't do any punching or anything really to the shell of the boot so kind of keeping it simple one thing i've had to do is add heaters because over the last like five years, my toes have just gone like they can't handle the cold at all. So boot heaters have kind of been a must. Elise likes this yeah. answer. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of boot heaters. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> the biggest thing is just it's back to the like high performance skiing. Like if I'm just like noodling around, I don't need boot heaters at all. But as soon as it's like stuff gets real and I want to actually ski or try to pull a move or something, it's like the boots have to be so tight. And like Elise is saying, she's in her like race plug boots with like touring, you know, it's like when you tighten those to performance level, there's just no blood flow. And so. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, tell you what, last question. And I promise I'll let you go. Um, but interesting question came in from Michael. How much do you rely on guides when filming in the backcountry or say with a heli outfit and and has that changed much now these days versus maybe earlier in your careers the so for me in my experience the only time um i'm ever working with a guide is uh like at a heli op on uh, a normal backcountry day film crews etc i've i'm not sure i've ever worked with a guide unless you were literally going to like a no, even like, even if you're going out to like a hut in BC or something, you're still on your own. You don't have a guide. Um, you rely on yourself. Um, and with that too, with guides, I think guides are there a lot of times for um, safety purposes for, um, and, and maybe already knowing the lay of the land and, and zones and that sort of thing, but they're not there telling you how to ski something. Um, you, but there, there are, uh, really good sources of information to gather snow information, bounce ideas off of, et cetera. Um, but when then it comes to actually skiing the lines that we choose, we're turning to the other athletes that we're skiing with and we bounce off the ideas between the other, the other skiers. Hmm. Pep, similar or different experience? Um, fairly similar, uh, yet I guess I would add that, you know, the guide is usually local to the area, so they understand the historical snowpack and weather patterns and that kind of information that is crucial for when you're, um, when you're stepping to something that's bigger. Um, it's just that, that local knowledge to help you, um, yeah feel more comfortable or say like, I, I really don't think this is a good idea to ski this particular line because it faces this aspect. It's, you know, whatever the variables are, because they will know them a lot better than, you know, than you can make that assessment. Um, particularly if you're out heli skiing because you just get, you know, zipped to the top or you ski like an adjacent face, which is fairly similar in aspect, but it's, not always exactly the same, but yeah, I think, I think, you know, when I'm just going out and say filming a project in the, in the Wasatch, like we don't have guides, like, but I'm also local there and, um, yeah, have that local knowledge and experience to go to the right places and, you know, um, 
attempt certain lines at the right time. Hmm. Sage? Yeah, I would say uh, very similar. Um, yeah, personally, it's like we definitely do a lot of kind of the self-guiding, which is just yeah, our normal program. And you're kind of either your places you're comfortable with or you're with a crew who someone is comfortable bully with usually um is, is the way things go down um i find that it's like yeah generally if you're the only times where have guides is at a, an operation so a cat skiing a heli skiing some sort of operation where it's guided and, and and even then the standard kind of um kind of balance with the guide and normal guests is the guide is kind of telling them because of all the things that elise and pep just said like the knowledge and the, the kind of experience that they have is they're telling you kind of where you can and can't go but for us and our kind of um because we have a different agenda we're not just trying to go ski powder or whatever we're trying to film a movie or, or do some sort of you know kind of thing then uh yeah we look at the guide as more um a hub of safety like lee said and is a person who's like kind of uh doesn't have their they have their uh, eye on the bigger picture. And whereas yeah. filmers and athletes, we're trying to assess the risks, but we're also like, you know, maybe uh, can be caught, uh, you know, more blind spots or potential. So it's nice to have that person. But the way I look at it as a guide is he's not there or she's not there to tell me where I can and can't go. It's not their responsibility. It's us to work together. They're there to help us as an athlete and as a film crew to make a good decision on what to do and, and how we're going to do that. And so I really love that, that kind of constant, you know, that ability to, to have someone who's a professional on that level. Um, but I also like am constantly like balancing out that kind of like, I'm not just going to go because a guide says it was okay or whatever, you know, you're kind of still using your own senses as well. So yeah. it does mm -hmm. come up and it's, pretty awesome experience to have but it's i find it's really like not super helpful for a guide to take us to a zone um like no disrespect to any guides who've taken me to a zone <laughs> but like <laughs> what what is like a rad place to ski like uh, if i just wanted to go skiing i would trust any guide to take me but when we want to film what we want to film is so like preposterously small or weird or something the yeah the light or whatever that like yeah like well it's just way better for us to be like give us a a, a region and we'll we'll find the the zone kind of um because yeah it's 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 ridiculous what we want sometimes <laughs> <laughs> that's great uh, um pep did you want to add to the add to that uh no no i i think he said everything very well and succinctly um yeah i think yeah i don't have anything to add <laughs> that, yeah. was, that was that was great yeah guides are amazing resources um i just yeah. I learned my very first heli trip ever for actually very first heli run with a guide. Um, it, yeah, you just, you can't, for what we do, we, we, we use them as a resource and not for someone that you just rely on to, to make decisions for you. You know, you've got to, you can't turn your brain off. And I think that goes for anyone. If you are going to any guided operation, that doesn't mean you should be turning your brain off. They're just a really valuable resource that you can get all kinds of information from for you to discuss because anytime you're stepping into the field, it's a collaborative effort, no matter your experience level. Definitely. That's been a new trend in the ski industry because like I was saying, basically almost all the heli ops are kind of just like, here's a beacon. Doesn't matter if you know how to use it, whatever, mm -hmm. like just <laughs> we'll hope for the best, but there's places now that are really bringing the clients on like I'm, I'm thinking of the blanket glacier blanket chalet uh marty mm -hmm. schaefer yeah. up in uh, revelstoke and the way they operate is like everybody who's there they're you're like in on the guide meeting and like mm -hmm. you know what's going on in the snowpack and mm -hmm. they're like informing everybody in the group 
like it's not just the guides kind of making the decisions behind the curtain um it's involving the the clients as well and that's empowering and educational and um it's it's cool that that's starting to happen so excellent uh hey it is always so much fun to get a chance to talk with each of you one-on-one and um you know, I had a hunch uh, bringing you together was going to be a real good time too. And uh, I think I was right about that. So um, <clears throat> thanks so much. Uh, I think this has been really terrific. And it is such a cool thing to be able to hear the kind of your collective experiences and perspectives on all these, you know, different questions and topics. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's y'all are the best and uh thanks so much for 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 doing this with us and uh i i look forward to getting to see you all uh, again in person uh the next time and as i said at the end of our last panel you know pep uh i'll see you in like six seconds but uh but to sage and elise uh i i hope the next time is soon yeah likewise it was great to see your faces Mm. yeah well yeah for sure Thanks so much. We will let you get back to your evenings and uh, good luck with the rest of this season. And uh, we will talk to you soon. Sweet. Cheers all. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks guys. Likewise. See you guys. Yeah. Great seeing y'all. Take care. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye.